The narrative is that Miami made this amazing move of turning Nikola Jokic into a scorer, not a passer. Is that really why the Miami Heat won game number two of the NBA Finals? Maybe not. Howard Beck, locked on NBA postseason and offseason expert, is with us. It's locked on NBA, and it's now. Eric Spolster didn't like the question much. It was a darn good one from Ramona Shelburne in the press conference, Howard. The narrative is, well, Miami solved this. They turned Jokic into a scorer. Last time I checked, he went 16 of 28. I have some other numbers for you. Are you buying this as the narrative of why Miami won game number two? Listen, I don't think that whether it was Ramona's question or anybody else who was pursuing that angle in the wake of that game last night, I don't think anybody was suggesting it was the sole reason but it was a very interesting and dramatic change from game one where Jokic controlled the entire game as he often does via the pass right Jokic has at times in the course of his career had to be urged to be a scorer by Michael Malone had to be nudged prodded you know told listen this is something you can do at a really high level but Jokic is the consummate playmaker and the personality of that team David and this is where I think this uh particular angle and the questions that came behind it were absolutely legitimate and look I get Spolster doing what he did I thought it was a little uh, too dismissive a little obnoxious in the moment frankly and I love Spo but you know come on it was a fair question and it wasn't people need to understand questions too like because I see this on social media unfold you're not asking the question specifically because you believe without a shadow of a doubt that you believe that the premise is correct The point of asking the question is to test the premise and see if the person you're talking to, coach, player, or otherwise, agrees. And if they don't, to hear why they're pushing back and whether that feels like it holds weight. So just a quick, you know, uh, a cue to watchers, listeners, fans. It's not about trying to be right or wrong. It's about a, a, a premise and an observation. That's what we do as reporters. You ask questions about observations. So... Spolster's response, I think a little too dismissive in that I'm a big believer that teams, especially teams that are built as ensembles as the Nuggets are, this isn't some star laden team. They have one supreme player in Jokic and some other very good players and a lot of role guys. Those kinds of teams operate best when everyone's in rhythm. And if you're going to tell me that Jokic taking 28 shots more than he took in any game this postseason more than he took in any game the entire regular season, and say that doesn't have an effect, I'd say you're lying. Of course it has an impact. Is it the sole reason that the game tipped the way it did? I mean, it came down to one shot that could have tied it at the end by Jamal Murray, and maybe we're having a different discussion if it goes into overtime and the Nuggets pull it out. But the fact is, and again, not making Jokic be a scorer, but making him beat you via his own shooting rather than having Porter getting off. Caldwell Pope going off, Gordon going off. If everybody else is kind of held in check and you're not having to scramble out to everywhere and have to account for everybody, and also, by the way, if they're not all dropping threes and Jokic is mostly scoring twos, of course that that's to your advantage on some level. And the other piece of it I'll just say uh, real quickly is I think role players, it, it's a really interesting dynamic in the NBA. If you feel really engaged and involved especially offensively, you play harder on defense. Everything else feels a little bit more on point. And if you're feeling a little bit um, stale, stagnant, if you're, or if you're waiting out there and you're not getting your shots, you're not getting touches, it can impact other areas of your game, not because guys are pouting or anything like that. It's just it's, it's more subconscious. Um, it's important for role guys to feel involved. So I'm not saying it's the sole reason, David. You can come back with all of your data that you've been working on for the last seven, eight hours, because I know you don't actually sleep. But uh, I would just say the premise is fair. The discussion is absolutely worthwhile. He's Howard Beck, longtime NBA writer at Lockdown's postseason expert and off-season expert, and that's why you hear this kind of breakdown. I'm David Locke. I hosted the original version of Locked on NBA, now host Locked on Jazz, and maybe have something to do with this network. We're going to talk about this. We'll, I'll give him exactly that. We'll also check out what other moves Spo's, Spo made today, and we'll look at the NBA coaching hires as we take you through it. Just so eager and excited, we dove right in to start this thing. All right, let's talk about it. I think there's a lot of validity to a lot of the things you just said right there. For example, the Nuggets only taking 28 threes. Like, that's a big deal. Like, that's... That's a low number for them. But the 
bottom line number to me is what was your offensive efficiency? And the Denver Nuggets offensive efficiency last night was a 124 offensive rating. They will win this series, I promise, if they have a 124 offensive rating. The offensive rating in game two was better than the offensive rating in game one. Their offense was better with this whole Jokic as a scorer thing. So yes, like I agree with the premise that the bench, the players don't feel as engaged. I agree with the premise that they're not taking as many threes. But the bottom line is they scored it nearly 1.24 at 1.24 points per possession. What changed in this game is that Miami's offense went from a point of possession to a 129. Miami went from being tired and emotionally spent at altitude against Boston from playing Boston and then at altitude and looking sluggish to getting two days off, acclimating to the thin air, playing with an incredible amount of zest and can't, couldn't miss a shot. That's what actually changed in this game. I actually think the entire Jokic pass or whatever narrative backs up all the reasons why I think Denver's going to win this series. Because if you can turn Jokic into a scorer per se, and their offensive rating is a 124. And if you turn Jokic into a passer and their offensive rating is like a 124, you're going to lose the series because Jokic is that great. And I think that's what he proved. The problem is Miami had more zest. Miami had more fight. Miami made a buttload of shots. And frankly, Denver was horrendous in the first four minutes of the first and third quarters for whatever reason. They simply didn't play hard. It was really weird. That's my take on the game. Totally yeah, different than everybody else. And 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 listen, every game takes on its own personality, and every game calls for its own uh, requirements. Let's say to win it. So I would just say the merger or, or, or middle point of these two arguments, David, would be this: everything you said is obviously correct. They they their offense was just as efficient in game two as game one. But game two required something else because if your defense couldn't quite contain Miami in the same way it did in game one, or if it was simply Miami uh, players acclimating to elevation or recovering from that seven game series, they had it's almost three days off, by the way. They play Thursday night, Sunday night. So you've got all day Friday, Saturday, and uh, almost all of Sunday. So you've got now 72 hours to have, in addition to the couple of days you were already there, to have finally acclimated to elevation. Um, to be that much more distanced from that, that intense game seven, everything else. But if, if what you should naturally expect, and I did was for the heat to shoot it a lot better in game two, they were missing open shots in game one, you know, lost in the game one. Listen, if we're leaning too far into narratives lost in the game, one narrative of, Oh my God, the nuggets are just this machine and the heat can't possibly keep up. They don't have the size. They don't have the scoring. They don't have this. They don't have that. They had a bunch of open shots that they missed, shots that the Heat were very capable of making. And my feeling was there's going to be a, a, a course correction there in terms of just a, the statistically. If they get all those open shots again, they're probably not missing them again. Um, it wasn't that they weren't getting good shots. It wasn't that they were being forced into bad shots. They were just missing wide open shots. They made their shots, especially coming right out of the gates in game two. And it changed the tenor of the game. So where does that then tee up your premise? It's this. If in game two... The Heat are now making their shots, and they're scoring at a much higher efficiency. You Maybe your 124 that you got in game one isn't good enough in game two. Maybe you actually have to be up another notch, and maybe having all of your guys engaged and in rhythm is actually the path because if, if, the, if the natural um, next step of your argument is, well, they just didn't defend hard enough or they didn't play tough enough. And Michael Malone's post game was clearly about much more about personality and demeanor and toughness and, 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 and basically meeting Miami's intensity level. And I think he's right on all that, but you know, the nuggets weren't built that way. Um, they were a middle of the pack defensive team all season, all postseason. That's not exactly their calling card. Their calling card is we're going to do just enough defensively and we're just going to destroy you offensively. We're going to pick you apart. Um, Jokic is going to be hitting everybody. He's going to get 12 assists, 14 assists. He's going to get 10 assists in a first quarter. And he's going to hit all of his open shots if you overcompensate. Well, maybe the Nuggets pass is the one that's always been there, which is they're not going to defend at the kind of level that it takes uh, to win games on its own. They just have to be an offensive show. And that part was just off enough in game two that it, it's, it's part of the loss. But again, no one thing 
caused the loss. Uh, it, it's it's all of the above. So um, I'm going to I'm going to be somewhere in the middle in all of this. As He's is my personality. Back. He's Howard Beck. I'm David Locke. Uh, I will say I, I've, I've never thought that the sounds of the game feature was fair to the coaches because I don't think it's been characterized well enough to the fans that the agreement with the coaches is we'll show, hear no strategy. So yeah. like I have friends that are Sixers fans and they're like, all Doc ever does is says, you know, cliche stuff. And he not like, okay, well, actually they're not allowed. I did think the Mike Malone, like, don't worry, we'll score, but you got to play. Yeah. Coach, the sound of the game was kind of an awesome moment because it gave you the insight that, like, he really is not concerned. With, he's exactly concerned with what you said. Like, what you just said is 100% true. Denver's not made that way. He knows that's the only way they lose this series is the fact that they're not made with the grit and the fight and the tenacity that Miami has. And that's the one thing, the way Miami wins the series, is that they do that. All right, we'll talk more about – there were some interesting little X's and O's moves. up. I'll, I'll get a little geeky. Howard will make it interesting. I'll just be a geek. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, – we'll move to coaches hiring as we continue here on Locked on NBA with Howard Beck, our postseason expert uh, for you. Today's show is brought to you in part by our friends over at Prize Picks. Prize picks with the promo code locked on, you get a hundred dollar match. But also, right now with prize picks, you have a chance to win one million dollars. That's right. Every single day of the NBA Finals, prize picks is going to give you an opportunity to win a million dollars. Here's what you have to do every day, prize picks will choose one person who's already selected and been uh, put their entry in to win the super flex promotion. Then if you're chosen, you pick six st- correct picks, you get a million. Five correct picks, you get $80,000. Four correct picks, 16000 But you must go to prizepicks.com slash a million to opt in at that eligible ink f- uh, link for that. Otherwise, prize picks, just great deal of fun for you to play. You pick two to five, two to six players. You can win up 25% of your money. You're not competing against other people. You're doing against projections. It's entries can be made in 60 seconds. Safe and fast and easy withdrawals. So download the prize picks app or go to prizepicks.com and sign up to play daily. Fantasy sports and first-time users, 100% deposit match up to $100. The promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, prize picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, you get $50. You got it. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on and sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. Thanks so much to all the everydayers here on Locked On Jazz that joined the show, or excuse me, Locked On NBA that joined the show. Uh, we'll have our regular crew. Jackson Gatlin ran around the NBA today in our regular group, which ironically and interesting or coincidentally not ironically coincident Howard would have caught me on that coincidentally our two I think it's our Tuesday show and our Friday show just happens to be one is a Nuggets host and one is a Heat host and then the other one is a Nuggets and a Heat host so we actually have locked in NBA has this incredible insight onto these two teams all right I thought there were a few interesting moves and like I don't want to like I get a little nervous like acting like a coach but so if you watch this is why I actually think makes Miami a better basketball team. That we like. So, I sometimes think our grit and our fight and our stuff is almost demeaning to like how good a basketball team they are. If you watch that Celtics game, they ran basically game seven, the same play the whole time. They had three guys up front. They ran them off sl- slips and split. Like no picks were set. They just rubbed off each other, made it really hard for like, am I switching? Am I not switching? First of all, they haven't run that play yet in the playoff series. Like, it's amazing to me that they had an entire game seven where they basically ran the same play the entire game. I haven't seen it yet in two games, which is pretty awesome. Second thing is they slip everything, right? Because you're switching to all of a sudden, midway through the night last night, they started setting picks on everything. Like, everything was actually, they stopped, they set the pick, they made the contact, and that caused Denver all sorts of difficult defensive problems. Like, it was a major switch to the way Miami plays. And I think it's, that's to me, that actually to me is a little bit of the storyline because the storylines we were talking about to me is the 129 offensive rating in Miami. Um, quite possibly. I, I, you know, listen, I think, you know, there's, there's everything the coaches do and that a player, the players will execute if, if they, if they, uh, the coaches hope they execute it anyway, in the course of a game. And I do think it can throw off the rhythm of, of the opponent when you have given them a steady diet of one thing and all of a sudden you shift. The thing is, in any game, if there's any uh, game plan whatsoever, and especially in the postseason, the job of the opponent then is to react in real time. You either do or you don't. Um, is this a, a quote-unquote adjustment that, that 
that tipped a game or tipped a series. Eh, maybe. I mean, but it's it's nothing is is entirely unexpected. Nothing is like new. There's not there's nothing there's no there are no mysteries here. Um, just the starting Kevin Love, like did starting Kevin Love change the whole tenor of this? Eh, probably not. And and you know, look, Love had I think Love had the second highest uh, plus minus in the game, so his presence mattered. Even if he didn't shoot all that well, makes makes a couple threes, grabbed I think ten rebounds or whatever, and um, had a couple of his his amazing outlet passes, his uh, you know eighty foot you know on a string passes. Um, all of it has an an impact, but. You know, your job in real time is is simply to uh, react, defend, do the things you're supposed to do. Um, and then when coaches start slipping into cliches about toughness and grit, a, a lot of it is is not so much about whether you are actually physically tough, obviously, or and even just mentally tough. It's about um, the discipline it takes to then, you know, uh, match that, rebut that, stick with it. Um not start blaming your teammate if, if if they didn't pick up the rotation behind you, all that kind of stuff. All right. I have to share one number in this on all these discussions. That's the best number of all. It doesn't really fit to what you just said, but I have to get it in. Duncan Robbins played, played 10 minutes and 34 seconds of the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. How many points per possession do you think Miami averaged in the 10 minutes and 34 seconds that Duncan Robinson played in the fourth quarter? No clue. Two. Wow. Two. They averaged two points every time they crossed half court for 10 minutes and 34 seconds of the fourth quarter last night. That's pretty stunning. Like that is, to me, like that's the story. They had a 180 offense rating in the fourth quarter. Like if there's something that just switched in this is that Miami did something in the fourth quarter and Denver couldn't get a stop. Maybe it's just simply Miami didn't miss a shot. But they also like... If you actually, they, they started getting better looks. They, they, they went 11, uh, they went six of seven on twos in the fourth quarter, five of nine on threes and nine of 10 from the free throw. Hmm. Like, to me, that's like some, some adjustment took place to your point, like players execute it. Now we'll get to what you were saying. Players execute it. Coaches do it. Like something happened there hmm. in that fourth quarter where Miami suddenly exploited what every single one of Denver's weaknesses is which used to be, and this was the, like, if you go back to what did we do this show about four weeks ago and you were like, hey, like, let's have Jokic advance in the playoffs before we put him in the pantheon of greatest players of all time. And the reason that Jokic had always been kind of held back was the idea that he just didn't defend well enough. Well, when you start to set the pick and now he's got to come up and hedge or he's got to play up because you can't play drop. Now we're starting to maybe exploit the one thing that's not perfect in Nikola Jokic's game. Yeah. And, you know, listen, um, the Nuggets have had the advantage, which they earned, of playing essentially from ahead this entire postseason. Um, They had not lost a home game in this entire postseason. And this is the first, you know, I hate the term adversity because it's just it's just such a stupid throwaway line. But this is really the, you know, the first tension pressure adversity whatever it is that they have faced in quite some time going to miami with a tied series having lost home court advantage um they're fortunate that adam silver and one of his first access commissioners switched the 232 to the 22111 because if this were still the 232 having lost home court going to miami for three straight games um for a team that's never been in the finals before, besides, uh, you know, we'd, we'd be we'd be having a, a different kind of discussion. Even still, um, I, I, I think we're going to learn something, you know, and I think Michael Malone, look again, because these are these are themes Michael Malone's been hitting for this entire era in the Jokic era about the uh, concerns about the demeanor sometimes of his team, the toughness of his team and everything else. Um, and Michael Malone being a guy who's always been wired to to emphasize defense want to have that kind of personality in his team and it's been a struggle to even pull them from the bottom third of the nba in defensive rating to just the middle which is a quite an achievement for this team um this is going to be a really interesting test like we're going to learn something about the nuggets over the next two games in particular I'm glad we had this Michael Malone moment because you know this as well as I do in the inner circles of the NBA. Like the other coach is like, wow, can you really like he kills his players with some regularity publicly. And there are a lot of coaches in the league who are like, wow, 
can you really get away? And he's gotten away with it for what, eight years now. It's kind of awesome. And he's, that truth, that truth serum that he gives in the locker room and yeah. then he gives to the media is unique to him as a coach. I'm glad we finally got one of those moments. He's old school in that way. He's, he's absolutely wired that way. And of course his father, Brendan Malone coached in the NBA for a long time. And I think that's just, that's just, you know, I mean, he's a New Yorker too. Well, you know, the, he's going to, he's going to speak directly. And uh, I appreciate it. I, I, I'm always in favor of more candor, not less. I also think that in today's NBA, too many coaches are way too cautious, uh, especially in their public assessments. It's okay to criticize. It's okay to call out what's going on. Um, players can take it and you know uh, but yes it is it is not the norm anymore it used to be more so okay major tactical mistake by the way with 12 seconds left you have two timeouts left you're down three you have to call timeout because it allow i understand the set defense but it allows you to play for a quick two and foul and use another timeout you then have two shots at it not one the not timeout with 12 seconds left was a mistake by mike malone you, if you have two timeouts, you can run a play that you can first use the two as a weapon where you collapse the defense and kick out, or you get the easy two because they don't want to foul. Now you're down one, you foul, and you end up with putting them at the line with a decent chance they miss one of the two free throws. And then you have about six seconds left to use your last timeout and diagram another play to either win or tie the game and go to overtime. That was a mistake by Mike Malone to not use that timeout. I understand the other side of the argument. F set defense, they got a decent... If you have one timeout, you might not call it. If you're down two, you might not. But down three, 12 seconds left, two timeouts, you have to use one. Also, their best playmaker, of course, is, is Jokic. And, and running something out of a timeout gives you the opportunity to – put him in some sort of action where they're either going to be, you know, tr you know, so, so obsessed with trying to cut off him or cut off passes. You're something's going to open up. Right. And, and using him as the hub of your, your playmaking um, you lost that in transition in that, in that moment. I'm agnostic on this though, David, I'll be honest. Like I, you know, we judge these things based on the results. If they'd got, if, if Murray hits the shot and it wasn't an easy shot, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to say like, Oh, well, he got the shot off. If it just goes, eh, it was a tough shot. And it, he, he threw kind of a line drive um, and, and Jimmy was all over him. So, but if the shot goes in where, you know, and they're, and then who knows, right? Cause still, you're still going to probably to overtime and we'll, we, we, we'll see what happens there in, in this uh, different timeline. But um, I, I, I don't know. Um, th there's, there's a justification for either way, an argument to be made either way. It, if it doesn't work out and, and, and the heat defend the hell out of the out of bounds play, are we saying, eh, you know what, you would have been better off just, you know, going in transition so they couldn't set the defense. I don't know. Howard Beck gets to choose who he wants to take to the prom next. What? Yeah. Howard Beck's going to the coaching prom next. I got a high schooler. Just graduated. These are the things that were on my mind. Howard Beck's going to the prom next as we continue on Locked On NBA. Your choice to go to the prom. Okay. Well, your choice to have as your NBA head coach. Let's play a little game. The first two, I think you might decide to take the selection. Monty Williams or Dwayne Casey? <laughs> um, in this case, Monty Williams, only because I, I I need a reset. My franchise needs a reset. The Detroit Pistons need to uh, stake out some kind of new direction and tone and everything else. I've got a young crew. I know that Monty Williams uh, just did an incredible job in taking a Phoenix Suns team that was absolutely nowhere before he got there and, with the help of Chris Paul, uh, got them somewhere. To the finals, in fact. So, um, yeah, it, it, no disrespect to Dwayne Casey, who's a fantastic coach and a great person. Um, but yeah, I'll go Monty Williams in that case. Okay, and this one you might agree as well. M.A. Udoka, Steven Silas. Huh. Uh, problematic question um, because uh, M.A. Udoka had the exit that he did in Boston for the reasons that he did. In a vacuum, Obviously, Ime Udoka is is the coach who I think has had a stronger impact. We talked in the last segment about the fact that we don't hear coaches really call out their players publicly anymore. Ime Udoka is an in your face, old school kind of coach who uh, who also knows how to, to to play the other side of that coin too with his players. But um, what you what Udoka did in his one season as head coach with Boston was just absolutely impressive. So yes, I'm taking Udoka. Okay, now we get to the fun ones. Monty Williams or Frank Vogel? <laughs> so here's where I'm going to hedge and just say, listen, sometimes 
and this is not the case in Phoenix, by the way. I'm just going to throw this out there because it's going to apply to some of our other situations. Sometimes a coach's run just comes to an end. Sometimes things get stale. Sometimes you've made the, the, as much of an impact as you can. And sometimes you just need a different face, a different voice, a different philosophy, a different something. And coaches themselves will tell you this sometimes that, hey, listen, after five years or so, they start to tune you out. You need buy-in, all that stuff. All that said, I still think I'd rather have Monty Williams than Frank Vogel. And all that said, I don't think that Monty Williams' dismissal in Phoenix was even remotely justified. And I think that uh, it doesn't matter who the coach is if they don't fix the roster. And that's a really weird thing to say, I know, about a team that's now built around Kevin Durant and Devin Booker. But the fact is, with the second that they made that trade and lost Cam Johnson and lost Mikhail Bridges and lost even Jay Crowder, who hadn't been playing, but still, if he had been playing, is, is still a valuable. Like, they lost all this depth. And they couldn't fix it midstream because that's what happens in the middle of a season when you make a blockbuster deal. The Suns' biggest challenge of this offseason was not to fix the coaching. Their coaching was fine. Their biggest issue is they need to replenish their depth. They need to rebuild around this new core that they have. They need to figure out what to do with DeAndre Ayton, who they still you know, are, are frustrated by his inconsistencies. They need to figure out what to do with Chris Paul, who clearly has lost more than a couple of steps and so none of that has to do with coaching. All of that has to do with personnel. Firing Monty Williams and replacing him with Frank Vogel, fine. Frank Vogel's a fine coach, won a championship with the Lakers, uh, got a couple of Pacers teams to the conference finals against the Heat back in the day. I, it, this is not a coaching issue. Okay. I'm just evidently in a feisty mood and bucking trends of narratives today. <laughs> so, like, I kind of agree with – like, I, frankly, I agreed with it 100% with Quinn in Utah. Like, it was just time. Like, I kind of always, like, I think there's something to that. Bud and Milwaukee. like Except for the fact that, like, I'm watching Mike Malone and Eric Spolster coach in the NBA Finals right now, one of which was hired in April of 2008, and the other was hired in June of 2015. And somehow both those organizations easily, at any mo multiple times, could have made the same decision on those sure. coaches and decided, but it actually worked. So maybe there's actually the other answer here is that the way that a coach's voice stays relevant is that the organization says, that's your coach. And yeah. if you have Mike Budenholzer as your head coach, because I'm sorry, I don't know anything about Adrian Griffin, but there aren't a lot of coaches like Mike Budenholzer, Adrian Griffin. You're going Mike Budenholzer, right? Of course, on, on accomplishments on resume alone, right? And Budenholzer is the one who coached the Bucks to the championship. So it's an unfair comparison by resume to resume, right? But we don't know what Adrian Griffin is going to be. Just like you know, we didn't know what Ime Udoka was going to be. Um, you know, th the fact is you have like – you would have taken, I mean, this is weird with, with a weird example in, in Boston because Brad Stevens pulled himself off the bench, right? But you would go Brad Stevens over Ime Udoka at, at the at the moment that they made that handoff. Um, because Ime Udoka had not been a head coach before. He had all, all you know, all the great reviews in the world as a longtime assistant and all the great expectations in the world. Turns out he's exactly what the Celtics needed at that time, but Brad Stevens had the better resume. So you I don't know that we can always judge it on resume. And listen. We're not going to know, David, until next season, whether it was right to fire Mike Budenholzer and hire Adrian Griffin as a rookie head coach who, listen, former player, been around the league a long time, been on a bunch of different benches. Adrian Griffin, uh, another one of these guys who for years people have said, keep an eye on. This is somebody who's going to be a very good head coach. He might be exactly what they need. Sometimes you do just need a change in philosophy and, pers and, and uh, personality and voice. It's one of those things you don't you don't know until the change is actually made, and you know Bud had almost gotten fired a couple of times. And to your point, yeah, maybe it was the right thing actually to stay with the continuity. And I have made the point myself that this NBA Finals is an example of how continuity can benefit you and why teams need to be more patient, not just at the coaching level, but also at the roster level. The Heat and, and Nuggets cores have been together for you know three four years at least each, which in today's NBA is an eon um and so th there's a case to be made for that but i every situation is a little different and so uh phoenix did not agree i did not agree with the, the coaching change milwaukee i'm not sure whether i do, do or not frankly but we'll you know that's one where i think the results will tell us whether or not they made the right decision all right final thing uh adam silver was on with chuck and uh those guys and they asked him about the mid-season tournament and i just mm. thought it was a super interesting conversation um, Adam Silver's been really transparent about like it's going to take time. What is your thought? I just want your thought on the midseason tournament next year and how you think it's going to play out. I'm trying to be nice. 
I'm trying to be nice, David. My my friends at the league office have have made their their pitch in various forms at times, uh, saying, "Listen, trust us on this. Here's why it's going to work. You know, I know you're skeptical, whatever. So I'm going to be nice, but I'm just going to say I remain I remain highly skeptical. I just I don't see the allure of it. And no, I'm not a soccer guy, so that's part of this. But even my friends who are devout soccer folks say yeah it works there for a reason and I, we don't need to go into all the details of that but like it it also it's it's been in place those tournaments for decades lifetimes um two questions why should the fans care about it i don't think anybody can answer that question why should the players care about it well the players are going to care about it because there's gonna be a lot of money at stake then again players make such an immense amount of money these days that any extra almost feels especially for the stars it's almost irrelevant it barely Im impacts them for the role players it, it's something an extra you know half million or something would would make a difference but not for the guys making 35 40 million a year um the players have to care first if the players and the teams care and they sh and they play like they care they show they care they uh talk about it as if they care as if this is this this whatever this trophy the david stern trophy whatever it's going to be if they speak about it as if it's meaningful and something that they are absolutely gunning for then their fans will get excited behind that. It's it's a lot of this is going to be how the teams themselves project their investment or not. I st even even with that, even with that, I'm not sold because I still think the fans are going to look at it and go, ah, oh, okay. And how does this affect June? Oh, it doesn't. Why do I care? Why do I care that somebody took home another trophy that's smaller, less prestigious, and that was just invented five minutes ago? I, I just don't see I, – I, I get the fact that the NBA feels it needs to put some new juice in the regular season. I get that. And I, I will respect any efforts that they make to do so. I'm just not sure this one's going to work. We'll see. Fans will buy in because it's a chance for their team to win. To win what? Just something, anything. People <laughs> like winning. <laughs> I mean, if it make it listen, if you can make it like uh, whatever it is, like those fourth quarter promotions where everybody in the arena gets like, you know, a coupon for, right. you know, a free right. pair of T-shirts that are extra large size that they don't fit about when they get right. or, or the two tacos for a price of one right. or something like that. Give Take all the say, baby. give all your fans something. If you win the David Stern Cup, then That's maybe right. fans will be invested. You get free Chick-fil-A and. Our arena, if you miss a second free throw, will be like it's the biggest cheer of the night every night. That's this is what I'm saying. Right. This is what I'm saying. That's how to get the fans engaged. Locked Buy on Heat and Locked on Nuggets are killing it on their finals coverage. Make sure you grab it with Adam Morris and Matt Moore on Locked on Nuggets. Wes Goldberg and David Ramiller are doing Locked on Heat. Those are both available for you. He's Howard Beck. He's the Locked on NBA postseason and offseason expert. Thanks so much for tuning in to Locked on NBA. Jackson's got his show out today. The regular crew's back tomorrow, so every day is Stay with it on Locked on NBA. Howard, thank you very much. Always a pleasure, sir.